Before we begin the content of this first lecture, I wanted to provide a bit of background on the different types of slides that you will see throughout this course. The first set of slides that you will see, and it's the one that we use mostly for this first lecture, you'll see have this kind of format to them. And these are ones that have been developed as the course has been offered. Um, in previous semesters, and this is the third time that it has been offered. And in most cases, they are slides that were developed by Dr. Jacqueline Clavel Hall. Um, so when you see slides like this, and you'll see across the bottom there, her name is indicated on them. Those are the ones that were originally created for previous semesters of this course by Dr. Clavel. You will see oftentimes I will add things to those and you'll be able to note those because you won't see Dr. Clavo's name and information at the bottom of those slides. Another type of slide that you will often see approximately two weeks before the course began, the publisher, Springer, released a third edition of the Translation of Evidence into Nursing and Healthcare. Now, we are still using the second edition because that's the one that um, we had included in the original book list. We didn't know the third edition would be coming out when we put out the book list for this year. However, one of the nice things that they have with the third edition is they have PowerPoints to accompany each of the individual chapters in the third edition. And since much of the book is still the same, you'll see that from time to time we will use slides that look like this and those are coming from the Springer Publishing Company and you can see across the bottom um, where you will note those and like the initial ones in instances where I have added in things of my own you'll note that I will remove the Springer information from the bottom. The third and final version of the slides that you will see throughout the course will look something like this. And these are ones that I have created independent of any of the other materials from the course. And in many cases, they will be focused upon things that I'm bringing into the course because of my background in education. Um, specifically educational research. So, And you'll note these because of the Toro logo across the top as well as the Toro colors that get used throughout. So getting back to the initial lecture for um, essentially the first couple of chapters of Brownson, I want to talk a little bit about some of the content that you find in chapter one um, you were also asked to read chapter 2, although as you'll note, chapter 2 is basically a description of all of these different types of definitions that you might find in different aspects of translational research and evidence-based practice as you are going through the course. And it's designed to allow us to have a common um, a common framework to work from, a common terminology to work from, because as the book notes, and for that matter, as the White et al. book notes as well, um, one of the biggest challenges with translational research is the fact that not just within the field of nursing, but even outside of the field of nursing, when the term translational research gets used, it means many different things to many different people. And speaking as someone who comes from a background in educational research, there are terms that we use in educational research that mean translational research, but we don't use the term translational research in much the same way we don't use the term evidence-based practice for the most part. But there are things that we do within education that look very much like evidence-based practice. So um, it's important for us all to have a common language that we use for these types of things. With that in mind, one of the definitions that we want to start off with is this idea of translational research. And the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has a nice definition that Dr. Clavo Hall used when she first taught this course, and I think it's a useful designation to continue to use. So according to the CDC, translational research is the systematic study of how a specific set of activities and designated strategies are used 
to successfully integrate an evidence-based public health intervention within a specific setting. So this is a nice broad idea of essentially how can we take things that are based upon reliable and valid research and turn them into specific interventions that get used within a local context so that they can have meaningful benefit for our patients. And according to the CDC, translational research is actually made up of three different types of research. Dissemination research, implementation research, and diffusion research. Now, the CDC defines dissemination research as the systematic study of how the targeted distribution of information and intervention materials to a specific public health audience can be successfully executed so that increased spread of knowledge about the evidence-based public health interventions achieves greater use and impact of the intervention. So essentially, once we identify some specific thing we should be doing, some practice we should be doing within our clinical work that we believe to be effective based upon multiple studies that have been replicated that have shown a high degree of reliability and validity, how do we get that information beyond just our knowledge to knowledge throughout our team? knowledge throughout our organization, knowledge throughout our region, knowledge throughout our state. How do we essentially get something that we should be doing based upon the research beyond just you doing it yourself to having a larger impact across the organization that you work for, the context in which you work in? On the other hand, implementation research, according to the CDC, is the systematic study of how a specific set of activities and design strategies are used to successfully integrate an evidence-based public health intervention within specific settings. So this one isn't necessarily focused upon getting people to know that they should be doing it. This is actually getting people to do it. So how do we get all of the members of your team to be doing something? How do we get you to do something on a regular basis as opposed to falling back into the way in which you've always done things? You know, how do we essentially use the research that of things that we know we should be doing to actually get people to be doing those things? That's what you're looking at when you're looking at implementation research. And finally, diffusion research. And the CDC defines diffusion research as the systematic study of the factors necessary for successful, successful adoption by stakeholders and the targeted population of an evidence-based intervention which results in widespread use. So you've got to the point where you've implemented something and you've tested the strategies and the strategies are working and you've got that information out to your team and the rest of your team are now doing it. Now, how do we diffuse that throughout the organization? How do we diffuse that throughout the entire hospital, throughout all of the hospitals within your particular system, to all of the hospitals that are operating in a specific county or in a specific region within the state, or if it was a smaller state like up in the Northeast somewhere, throughout the state, and even in larger states like California and Texas and, and well, most of the West for that matter. Um, you know, how do we get it throughout the state and, and eventually, you know, doing it at a national and international level? How do we diffuse that information out there so that people are actually doing what it is the research indicates is a best practice for them to do. So one of the issues obviously that looks at with all of these is the issue of how do you go about scaling up and one of the things that um, Brownson and his colleagues write about in these first two chapters is both the lack of a common defin or consistent definition for these things and then the various factors or elements that you have, um, classifications that you have when you're looking to scale up. And you can see at the bottom there, there's a link to 
a publication that's been made available by the author on ResearchGate, this idea of scaling up high-impact interventions, how it's done. That's a really interesting reading, and while it's not listed as one of the supplemental readings, um, it is one that I would strongly encourage that you look at. I know I found it quite useful as I was preparing for the material for this week. And uh, so while Bronson and, uh, and his colleagues talk about scaling up a little bit, that article I think is something that would be useful for you as you continue to explore this topic. One of the other things that Bronson and his colleagues talk about is this idea of de-implementation because if you look at the examples or if you listen to the examples that I gave for all of the other slides, it was how do we take something that the research says we should be doing? Well, there's a lot of stuff that we do within the healthcare setting that the research says that we shouldn't be doing, that we should either be stopping um, altogether or that we should at least be changing how we go about doing it to make it more effective. And this organization here, Choosing Wisely, or it's actually not an organization, it's an initiative or a project, um, is quite fascinating because it actually goes through and it chronicles or documents uh, many practices that are quite common within the healthcare setting. And as you look through the list, I'm sure you will probably recognize many more than I recognize of things that you do yourself or that you f see your colleagues doing on a regular basis that, according to the research, maybe we shouldn't be doing, or not maybe we shouldn't be doing, that we shouldn't be doing altogether. So this idea of how do we de-implement something um, is also something that gets tied up into this idea of translational research. So don't let the, the title of the text, Dissemination and Implementation of Research in Healthcare, lull you into this notion that it's always about doing something. Um, in many cases, uh, as these folks from the ABIM Foundation have documented, it's about stopping something that we've been doing for a long time. While Bronson touches on this a little bit on pages 12 and 13, it is something that I think is worth diving into more. And in all honesty, I would suggest that as you start thinking about your own doctoral research and what you might look at doing, taking a de-implementation project might be something that uh, would be both challenging, but also something that might be quite rewarding within your particular setting. One of the things that Bronson and his colleagues spend a bit of time on, and they start talking about it um, really on page three, and it continues on through up to page six or seven, there is this idea of the gap between you know, when we start doing research on a particular practice or on a particular topic and when that research actually has some sort of meaningful impact upon practice. Over a decade ago, Green actually did a study that looked at the length of time that it took for these types of things to actually happen. And he found that on average, between the time that an organization decides that it is going to make something a priority for research funding to the time that it actually gets adopted on a wide scale fashion within practice, there tends to be a 17 year gap. And the textbook itself provides us with three examples of instances where we've seen a considerable gap with penicillin, insulin, and smallpox. I know when Dr. Clavo Hall did this course last year, she included this example, which, um, as you can see, is much more considerable in terms of the time frame, as it says there in the orange from the time, you know, in 1601, when Lancaster found what he thought was a potential solution for the problem of, of scurvy within his crew. It took 264 years before it was something that was adopted by uh, British seafarers throughout the age of exploration. And um, while that's 264 years from when Lancaster tested it, if you look at it, the idea for it actually occurred 104 years before that, or 
368 years before it actually became widespread practice. One of the other things that we have within the uh, text that I want to mention, and it starts there on page 6 and 7, is this notion of the translational research continuum. Because one of the things that I have found with doctoral students, regardless of the discipline, is that when they start looking at translational research or whatever that is called in their specific discipline, you'll see that there's these four stages that you have here, or these four parts of the continuum. And when you look at the four of them, the first one, T1, that's your bench research. That's, you know, the the research that's happening in the, the wide part of that cone when we were looking at it two slides ago. T2 is where you start to see some of the guidelines and regulations being put into place so that it will actually start happening in practice. T3 is where we live in terms of the types of research that you're going to be doing as part of your doctoral studies. The actual translational research that you're going to be engaged in is going to be in that T3, that orange continuum that you see there. Now, depending on the nature of your project, you may spill out a bit and, and have some impact in that T4 realm, that, that fourth green area there. But for the most part, pretty much everything that we do um, from a research perspective um, within your doctoral studies will fall into that T3 realm. You know, that idea of, you know, either using dissemination research, implementation research, or diffusion research. And for most of us, at least based upon previous cohorts, it's likely going to be implementation research that we're focused upon. So it's one of the things I, I, I mentioned because as I look at this, so often um, doctoral students, regardless of discipline, they think bigger than that T3 realm. Um, they look at, in some cases, going right back to doing some of the work that you find being done in, in the T1 cycle that's there, that, that bench research, that basic science, that basic research that's happening uh, there, which um, is not the focus of a practitioner-oriented doctoral degree like the DNP. Um, so one of the things as you read through the two or three pages that looks at this uh, translational research continuum there in chapter one of Brownson. Remember that it's in that T3 area that we are focused upon as a part of our work that you're going to be doing here at Toro University, California. So that's an introduction to and a bit of an overview of some of the main features that you should take away from the first couple of chapters of uh, Bronson and his co-authors. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or to use the discussion form that's called Questions and Support. Um, and I'd encourage you to do that as opposed to emailing me. Not because I don't want to hear from you. In fact, I'm more than happy to engage with you all through email. But the Discussion forum is a public forum that's available to everyone within the course and there are eight to ten of you and there's one of me. So the chances that one of your colleagues will see your query before I do, mathematically speaking, is actually quite high. And they may know the answer to that question or they may be able to add to my answer by providing specific examples from their professional context, which may help not only you, but all of the other students in the class that are reading that question and reading those answers. It may help them understand the topic a little bit better. So by using that public form, not only do you benefit from the knowledge and experiences of your colleagues, but you also allow your colleagues to benefit from the fact that you had a query about something. So I'd encourage you to use that form as much as possible.